my colleague, uh, friend, Lovis Alexander, just told me I need to tell a joke at the beginning of uh, this uh, and on the, uh, uh, behind the edutainment lecture that we had in the previous lecture by colleagues at St. Louis University. I feel like I need to say something uh, funny, but I can't uh, think of anything now that I'm on the spot. Uh, <laughs> But hopefully this will be uh, somewhat edutaining um, uh, and also informational uh, as we go through a cultural competency algorithm. And uh, I'm Dr. Kenny Raley at the Duke PA program, so it's a pleasure to be here. I have no relevant financial or non-financial uh, relationships to disclose. Um, and my wife may come in later with my little baby. Uh, so uh, if you hear a crying baby in the background, that's her. If I am crying, uh, <laughs> we'll stop the lecture. Uh, <laughs> So let's jump right in. Um, so let's start out with a case. You know, it seems like in medicine, they always start out with a case. So I'm going to present one to you all. You are a seasoned faculty member at an accredited PA program, and you have 55 students uh, each year um, with plans to expand. It seems like the PA profession is obviously doing very, very well, and excitingly so. Um, as usual, you filled your class with top-notch candidates. Uh, and you're very proud of your class. Let's give you some vital statistics of your program, mostly female, which is a reflection of the PA profession, um, at least the incoming class is 28% male. Uh, and there's some breakdown of the demographics in your class. It's traditional uh, program with one year preclinical coursework followed by some clinical um, studies, which the program being 54 weeks and then 52 weeks. And just so you know, I took these, this information directly from the annual education forum. These are all the averages of uh, the PA uh, programs across the, inst uh, the, the country, at least the programs that um, gave data to uh, the PAEA. So essentially your program is not average, but it is average, obviously. <laughs> All right. When reviewing your program, you noticed a few things. Perhaps you thought that uh, there would be a little bit more gender and ethnic diversity, and it wasn't as much as you uh, would have expected or thought in your particular area. And you've also received some feedback from clinical students um, that some of the preceptors and the individuals that, uh, that, are, that they are working with uh, have been heard making insensitive remarks regarding students, possibly patients, and even other specialty services. I happen to be a family medicine physician at a major academic institution at Duke. Um, so, you know, a lot of times as a primary care provider, and I can get on a soapbox for a long time about it, you often feel not necessarily included when it's such a research-based institution. And perhaps in, in this instance, in this case, uh, you may have heard some disparaging remarks about uh, certain specialty services. No formal complaints have been made, but sometimes it often feels very high schoolish on the rotations. Your students have complained. As a result of these issues, you took it upon yourself uh, to think about cultural competency and how could you potentially introduce this topic uh, into your program. So uh, you are going to approach your division chief or your department chair or associate program director and say, I have the answer and what you all need to figure out in the next 40 minutes and hopefully I can help facilitate that. So what do we do, all right? And that's why we're here. So I have a few uh, objectives. I'm not going to read these to you, but the bottom line is there's a tremendous amount of interest in cultural competency education um, that's going on in medical education, which is exciting. And I would uh, posit that potentially there's a proactive reason for this and then potentially a reactive reason. And on the proactive side, I think many of us are realizing that diversity is increasing, not only in our population, but also in our classes. Um, so talking about cultural issues is extremely important. And then there's the reactive side of things. Perhaps like in this case, there were instances or complaints or issues going on. And we also have to think about the accrediting bodies. So the LCME, um, also the AAMC and ARCPA have recommendations about what our program should be doing regarding cultural competency, which is a reactive approach uh, as well, but just as important. So whatever the means by which we get to it, cultural competency education is important. And I think we're realizing that uh, patient satisfaction uh, goes up when we have providers that are able to communicate with a diverse set of patients. So let's talk about some statistics to give you a backdrop uh, of kind of what, why this is important. So in the United States in 2013, this is taken from the census, you can see that uh, the white American population is about 77 percent, Hispanic 17.1 percent, African American 13.2 percent. Um, interestingly, that bottom statistic shows you that almost a quarter of the individuals don't speak English as a first language at home. 
Um, so many of our new generation, our millennials, as we continue to think about PA education of the future on the heels of our keynote address this morning, we have to think about, well, who are the students that are going to be in the, cl in the classes that we are teaching? And ultimately, what we are realizing is that by about 2023, uh, nearly half of the population will be traditionally non-white. Uh, and new children that are born in this country. So I think many would agree that diversity increasing in this uh, country is a good thing um, and uh, maybe preaching to the choir, so to speak. So traditionally, when we think about culture, perhaps we are used to thinking about it from the standpoint of race, right? So we think of race as a division of humankind having distinct physical characteristics on our application forms. We check race. When we even say the word, we're thinking about race. But I actually am not the biggest fan of the word race. Um, and the more we understand about the human genome, the more we understand about genetics, we are realizing that most of us aren't that different. And m many of the differences are phenotypic differences or, gen or geographic dis differences, essentially accidents of birth. About 96 to 97% of us are the same. So truly, there isn't any other race other than the human race. So I would encourage you as we to think about that. So I think of race this way, right? It's a competition between runners, horses, vehicles, boats. So I want you, if you take nothing else from this lecture, Let's maybe change even how we think about race and even using the word race. I think we would all agree that we're all human. I want us to move towards thinking about ethnicity, right? So ethnicity is a state of belonging to a social group. And you may identify with a particular nationality or a cultural tradition. So that's almost there. But what's really even better is thinking about culture. So what exactly is culture? And I love the analogy of an iceberg because culture is like ice, an iceberg in the sense that so much of who we are, I would say, I would, I would posit that is beneath the surface. So traditionally, I think in our country specifically, we think about perhaps culture meaning these things, things that we can observe, phenotypic characteristics, when actually most, I would say, most of us would agree who we are is beneath the surface. You can't tell most things about me. Um, by just looking at me. You, we may assume we can, but in fact, what we don't see probably is more important to who we are, who we love, where we learned, who we choose to love, who, we, who our friends are, things that we think about gender, about etiquette, uh, about fairness, cleanliness. All these things are beneath the surface, but in fact are more important. A culturally competent provider is one that can navigate these things, and truly, as we work towards cultural competency. I don't think anyone can ever achieve it. You know, competency is this, this buzzword now within graduate medical education. Perhaps a better term is cultural humility, meaning we are working towards being better at this. And culturally competent or, or, or providers that are working towards cultural humility are able to navigate these things beneath the surface. And that's what I want us to do. So if you didn't believe me about culture, I have a brief anecdote. So I'm from St. Louis originally. Um, and I moved to North Carolina a um, few years back. And one thing I noticed when I got to North Carolina is that when people were ordering um, food, they would have tea. So in St. Louis, I never got tea because I'd have to sweeten it, right? So when I got to North Carolina, I'm like, why do so many people like tea here? <laughs> so then I actually asked, and they said, oh, well, this sweet tea. I'm, well, I've had sweet tea, obviously, in my life. Uh, but I didn't realize, you know, just how good sweet tea could be that I should have it with every meal. So it took, <laughs> it took several months, actually, for me to wean myself off of sweet tea. Just coming from the Midwest, where traditionally no one drank sweet tea, to the South, where everybody drank sweet tea. Another thing I learned, and if you ever come to North Carolina, you must go to the North Carolina State Fair. Now in St. Louis, you know, we have, you know, Fair St. Louis, this is a big deal. Um, the World's Fair used to be in St. Louis, um, but we didn't have the types of foods that I could now get in North Carolina. So right now, the fair, we're actually missing it. At this moment, um, the North Carolina State Fair, if you want anything fried, you can get it, right? My wife, who I did see walk in in the back, she tried this Krispy Kreme uh, hamburger. This is a Krispy Kreme hamburger uh, there. <laughs> But you can get a deep fried Snickers bar, a deep fried Twinkie, obviously Bojangles. There were no Bojangles where I'm from in St. Louis. Um, so the point is, food is actually a culture, right? Culture is all around us. Culture is everywhere, especially in the hospital. Think about it like this. So one thing, the professional culture of medicine, right? When we don our white coats, what does it symbolize? I think traditionally we think of medicine uh, as a virtuous profession. We talk about humility, um, respect. 
And we teach our students, hopefully, when they enter into graduate school, PA school, to think about their new culture as a professional culture, which is important, something that we want to share. That culture also means something to patients. When we walk in a room with a white coat on, a clean, crisp white coat, what does that mean? Oftentimes, it, it may mean sterility. It could mean cleanliness. That means something in the hospital. Another area that perhaps um, you might ne not necessarily think about, but as a, as a family physician, as an MD, now in the PA world and as a true PA advocate, I'm realizing that a lot of medicine is very doctor-centric. Uh, one of my uh, friends just this morning, we made a joke about the fact that uh, it didn't seem, sometimes it seems like in meetings until the doctor says something that perhaps <laughs> it's not as meaningful when there are PAs and MPs and lots of people that have been practicing medicine for much longer than some even MDs that are experts, but it's very MD-centric often in our institutions, and in academic institutions uh, specifically, but also in our language. Think about when someone says, well, um, I have a doctor's appointment, or I'm going to the doctor's office. Something just as simple, our culture is, well, nowadays we have to realize the fact that, no, your provider, your primary care provider may not be a doctor. Your, your specialty provider may not be a doctor. So this culture that we have is, is very MD-centric. What about the hidden curriculum, right? That curriculum that we learn when we enter medicine. It isn't necessarily taught, but is modeled around us as we go on our rotations. That in and of itself is a culture. Perhaps no other um, um, uh, professions have as, as a high impact as the hidden curriculum does in medicine. We model what we do. I prescribe hydrochlorothiazide, well, because the provider that I worked with provided, prescribed hydrochlorothiazide, when in fact the evidence for hydrochlorothiazide isn't as good as for costalidone. But why do we prescribe hydrochlorothiazide, right? So there's this culture that we pass on. Doctor talk. Think about how we even present our patients. The fact that we use subjective to describe how our patients, as if our patients talking to us isn't factual. The patient states, the patient reports. You know, our framework within medicine is if we as the providers are, are the ones that have the facts, but the patient just reports or states. Even those of us that have friends outside of medicine, I found it was very hard to have relationships outside of medicine because all I wanted to do was talk about what was going on in the hospital and the things that I go through. So there's, again, a culture. Specialty versus primary care. Depending on where you are and where you learn this country, we're very specialty focused. But in other institutions, other places around the world, it's very primary care. Culture influences outcomes. We know that, right? What our patients eat, who they love, all those types of things. And this is just an example from the Joint National Commission of showing you perhaps for blood pressure the types of things that can be modified or changed just based on cultural elements. What someone eats. Right? If they exercise or not, where they grow up, accident of birth. So the bottom line is culture is important. So imagine this is your patient. Does everyone know who this is? Okay, if you don't, then you must leave now. No. <laughs> so this is Lieutenant Commander Worf, okay? And he's Klingon. So this is a this is a gentleman from Star Trek. And yes, Star Trek is real. Um, that, <laughs> so for any of you that are, are, are no Star Trek lore, Throw, tell me some things about Klingons. What do we know about Klingons? Warriors, right? Warriors. What else? Some characteristics of Klingons. Okay, they have their own language, right? So some things aggressive, some thought to be warrior people, warlord-like people. But if anyone knows Lieutenant Commander Worf, like I know Lieutenant Commander Worf, <laughs> we know that he's a sweetheart, right? He's just a nice guy. So imagine this patient walked in your room. Well, you may think you were in uh, the twilight zone. <laughs> but what happens to us when a patient walks in a room? What, what they look like? So what we could assume about Lieutenant Commander Worf, just looking at him, is that he potentially could have certain characteristics. And the question becomes, as we work to our cultural competence, who are we less competent with? And we have to actively think about it, because if you don't, you might, not, you might think that you're doing OK. So the cultural competence or humility is having the knowledge, respect, the ability to essentially navigate lots of different people, no matter who they are. And I think all of us in medicine would agree that's what we want to do. It's not as easy as it would, as it would seem. So many of us may think, well, I would never do that. I'm culturally competent. I'm not biased. Most of my friends are X, right? Or don't we have more important things to worry about? Why do we even care? Why are you spending so much time talking about cultural competence? And a lot of times, we may think that we know this material. But I would uh, encourage you to think of it in another way. So let's watch something. <clears throat> Hi, 
I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck. But she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Give a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. It's not over. So, how many people saw that, noticed that? Anyone? Okay. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing colour-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, OK, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. OK. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. And what I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, an excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing colour changing card trick. Very interesting. So what is the point of showing you that video? Can anybody guess? Well, the thing about cultural competency and any of the learning is that perspective matters, right? But also what we're talking about is bias. And the point is it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. So what are biases? So biases and what I like to call are cognitive shortcuts, essentially information that we use to get to a conclusion. Many of us hear the word bias and it makes us uncomfortable, but the fact of the matter is that we use stereotypes every day and we use biases every day, they actually serve us well. Our brains are organized to do that. We take information, we process it, and we make decisions based on that. If it's 2 a.m. in a Philadelphia alley, and I'm by myself, I see a gentleman down that alley, chances are if I go down that alley, perhaps I could put myself in danger. I am using the information that is in front of me to make a decision, right? Our brains work that way. The problem with biases is a lot of times they're approximations of the truth they are rarely applicable to every encounter. So when we hear thunder, it may mean rain, but it does not always equal rain, right? Biases influence our thoughts and actions, and the fact of the matter is that they're happening even now on an unconscious level, and many of them we're not aware of. So if you don't look for it, the chances are you may think that you don't have bias, but the fact of the matter is that we all do. And that uh, video shows you that if you're not looking for something, it's very easy to miss it. If you ever want another interesting video that you could potentially use in teaching um, um, instances is the moonwalking bear. So Google moonwalking bear. It's another example that if you don't look for something, it's very easy to miss it. So I would suggest that medical training actually potentially makes us more biased, right? So we already have the framework that we use information to make decisions, but what we are asking our students to do and what we do every day as clinical detectives is we take the information that the patient gives us, that chief complaint, and we want to get to a conclusion within 15 to 30 minutes, or at least in primary care. But think about how we present information. This disease is most common in. 
Men over 50 are at risk for. Women are more likely. Obesity. African Americans have the highest rate of. What is that doing to us as providers as we continually see those statistics, right? I know with me, when I first started practice, I went into it thinking, oh, all the patients are going to do exactly what I say, <laughs> right? I'm going to go in. They're going to do what I say. No one's going to try to take advantage of me. All the patients with back pain really have back pain, right? They're not looking for Percocet. And then I had a few ish situations where, a pay, where I actually I was contacted by the police. I was writing prescriptions I thought appropriately, but some individuals had been going to multiple places and getting prescriptions. So then what happened to me after those four or five patients? Whenever I saw chief complaint back pain, I did this sometimes external eye roll or even internally. And when I walked in the room, I say, OK, Mr. Jones, he's 25 and he's here for back pain. What brings you in today? And maybe I'm looking at the computer instead of looking at the patient. So as a result of a few instances, a few circumstances, I made judgments on potentially future patients. So I was biased. Think about what happens even in, let's just say, don't go into primary care. And again, I can get on a soapbox about family medicine and primary care for a long time. But some of the things that happens in the hospital, oh, it's OK that he acted that way. He's just a surgeon. It's OK that he threw those utensils across the room at the, at the student. That's how surgeons are. These types of things within our training, we are reinforcing. So that makes it extra important for us to mitigate and to think about our biases within medical training. So what are the potential outcomes? Poor provider-patient relationship. Obviously, many patients may feel that their provider is not listening to them, that they couldn't connect to their provider. Patients have biases, too. That may happen before you even walk in the room. A person that may be African American may see a person of a majority background and say, oh, that person doesn't care about me, they're white. That's a bias. It may not necessarily be true. And that colors that experience. And the same thing can happen. When you walk in a room and you have an African American patient, potentially with diabetes, hypertension, and perhaps you've had patients in the past that weren't very compliant, and you say, well, this person's not going to change. And then what happens, right? And that causes trouble. Mistakes can happen as a result of biases. I don't know if any of you are a fan of Sherlock Holmes. I'm a huge fan of Sherlock Holmes, and I love detectives. Perhaps that's why I entered medicine. I think of myself as a detective. But if you remember in the Sherlock Holmes movie with Robert Downey Jr., there was this place where he was meeting Watson's wife. And he made all of these assumptions based upon some markings and some scars, and that's what Sherlock Holmes does, right? And at the end of it, he says, uh, you know, essentially alludes to the fact that perhaps uh, her uh, fiance or previous fiance had been cheating and she left him. And she, he was right. She says, you're right on all accounts, except he died. So she throws a glass of water in his face. So the problem is that information that we use is important, but it can often lead to mistakes and grave mistakes when we have biases. Personal unhappiness for the provider, that can happen. If you are expecting a certain outcome when you enter medicine, much like me, when I started, the patients are going to do what I say. When, they, when you come back, your hemoglobin A1C is going to be better, and you're not going to weigh 20 pounds more than the last time I saw you. And then the flip side happened, right? So I'm thinking, wow, this is not what I signed up for. This is really difficult. And then what happened? I began to get burnout, and, I, and the session about burnout talked about these things. Student mistreatment, this can happen, right? Biases can affect how, we, how students are treated. It can affect what students observe in the hospital. And then healthcare disparities, ultimately. And many of us that are interested in the field of healthcare disparities, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, some of this is provider bias. So the fact of the matter is we all have it. This is just a study I like to throw up um, because it shows that this happens. Essentially, this study, what they did was they took video vignettes of patients. That, uh, and the question was, which one of these patients needs cardiac catheterization? And the providers, they were family physicians and cardiologists. They were asked to look at the video and decide, does this person need cardiac catheterization or not? And the only thing that was different about these individuals was gender and ethnicity. The scripts were exactly the same. So nothing changed, and all the providers had to do was decide, well, who needs cardiac catheterization? And unfortunately so, what we found was that certain groups were less likely to get recommended despite the same symptoms, despite um, the same presentation. And that was African-American women and African-American men. So the bottom line is we all have bias, and it is affecting our outcomes. Um, so I'm not going to read to you all of these slides, but another thing to think about as we transition more into what can we do is that there are standards, and the ARC-PA uh, and the PA profession, I think, has led medicine in many ways. 
And one of those ways is adopting uh, standards that recommend that we should include this in our education of students. So B106 and B209 uh, is a must, meaning when you are thinking about accreditation, and not necessarily that we are, are making all the changes in our program and innovations based on accreditation, but this supports what we do if you do it, is that we should be including cultural competency instruction and essentially realizing that uh, the concepts of diversity and cultural humility or cultural competency, patient-centered care, are part of what we should be doing. And this isn't separate. This isn't necessarily an added thing that you need to do because good cultural skills equal good clinical skills. We are better providers when we can do it for lots of different people. Um, also, this just shows you that there's more support for this uh, information through many of these organizations that collaborated to create the competencies for the physician assistant profession, and I highlighted uh, what was important for you, and these slides are available so you can have access to them. Essentially, we need to demonstrate compassionate and respectful behaviors when interacting with patients and their families. And that doesn't matter what a patient looks like or who they are or who they love. That's important to consider. And this just shows you sensitivity to a diverse patient population. These are all things that we can use to support our decisions to integrate this into our programs. So traditionally, there's three conceptual approaches that have emerged for teaching cultural competence, knowledge-based programs, attitude, and skill-based program. So what do those mean? Essentially, knowledge-based programs are those ones that focus on particular cultures. So teaching about uh, individuals from a Hispanic or Latino background, or teaching about individuals from China. Right? Attitude-based programs are those types of interventions that deal with bias, those types of interventions that deal with stereotype threat, racism, and then skill building programs are actually tools where we teach the students uh, how to do a better interview or how to do a different interview. So there's, in some programs, integrate all of these, and I would say that to varying degrees of success, there are some that are better than others, and I'm hopefully going to make some recommendations for you. All right. This is just a research article that comes out of the PAEA Journal, which is a great article for you to read, but I'm going to summarize it uh, for you briefly. Essentially, in 2003, uh, these researchers, and some of them may be at the, uh, at the conference, hopefully not in the room, uh, <laughs> but uh, if they are, then I'd love their input uh, in this as well. But essentially, they surveyed program directors in the annual program director survey, and they had individuals uh, write back, what did, how do you teach cultural competency education? And they had about a 51% response rate at that point in 2003. I think there were about 120 programs or so. So 60 or so responded. And essentially, this is a lot of information on this slide. But with the mean lecture hours for uh, those programs was first 13.5 hours. So, and that ranged anywhere from zero, obviously, to 60 hours of cultural competency education throughout the two-year uh, or three-year program, whatever that uh, was. And essentially, all this is just showing you is all the different ways that cultural competency can be taught. And this, what you can take from this slide is that many institutions and many programs do it differently, right? So there's lecture that most of the programs used. Uh, case studies, 74% of the programs use. There's role playing, OSCE, small group discussion, depending upon the program. And again, this is only about 60 programs or so out of all of the, out of all of the potential programs. And then activities related to cultural competency and basically what percentage of programs were doing something potentially not in this category, but outside. So community-based rotations, all things that we would consider boxes that we could check within cultural competency. So the PA profession, as I mentioned earlier, I think has done very, very well in integrating cultural competency into education, perhaps even at an earlier point than traditional MD programs. So it's out there, and there are many of you that are already doing this, so I may be preaching to the choir. The issue is that there are some challenges, and one of those, and I mentioned bias can be unconscious, so one of the challenges is dealing with helping people understand that we are all biased, and individuals may be resistant to that when we have that, that initial uh, shock of saying, no, I think of everyone the same, when in fact we don't, and we can't. It's not possible to do that. Time and timing. So scholarship versus service demands. Many of you in the administrative role or curricular planners, there's a lot to fit into the PA education. I'm a physician, and I, if I had to do it all over again, I think I would go back and be a PA. But looking at how much you have to cram in, I, I am just awe-inspired and impressed by the individuals that are able to do that. 
uh, within a year and then have clinical rotation. So there's not a lot of time. So that's a challenge when you say, oh, now we have to add in cultural competency education. Now, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll realize that it's not as hard as we may assume. And then there's learner resistance. And I threw up that slide earlier. Many um, learners say, look, I came here to learn medicine. I came here to get pathophysiology. I want to I want to take care of my patients. Why are you teaching me all these soft sciences, right? Many of the learners. So there's there that is a common challenge. Some others, traditional medical training model still persists. So there's this emphasis on the biomedical aspects still within medicine. Although we are all beginning to realize the psychosocial aspects of medicine, the social determinants of health are very important. We are still fighting kind of the old belief that you know there's one way to do this. You go to lecture and you learn about medicine, you memorize as much as you can, and then you're a great provider on the other end. When in fact, that's probably not the case. Classroom conflicts with clinical settings. Well, what does that mean? Well, we could teach as much cultural competency as we want in the first year, but then when they get on those rotations, what is happening? They are modeling what they see, right? Or they begin as they practice to do what they see. Unfortunately, I deal with it all the time with my medical students, is that many of the times the things that they're seeing in the OR, the things that they're seeing on rotations, is, is, is very, very uh, discouraging to them when they are taught one way and at the same time they see the people that are in charge acting a completely different way and they're getting accolades within their field. They're getting more research dollars and, and, and put lots of publications and they think, well, why do I need to know this stuff? That isn't what it takes to succeed. Cultural insensitivity is frankly a reality, folks. All of us have it in various ways. Um, and that happens on the student side, but also on the faculty side. And then there's the concept of institutional non-support. So meaning diversity may be important on our charter. Diversity may be important in our mission statement, but yet it's not acted upon. And that's a challenge for some institutions where we may have leaders that say, well, yes, diversity is important, but when it matters, when it comes to dollars, when it comes to repercussions, if it's not done or cultural competency isn't included, well, what happens, right? So that is a challenge. So this is what I created, an up-to-date algorithm for success. And I don't think I'm breaking any copyright laws by using the words up-to-date. <laughs> I had it capitalized at first, and I was like, well, I'll put it in lowercase. So it's just up-to-date, meaning we're going to get up-to-date by doing it. And this is just a brief overview. And again, you're going to have access to this. And I'm going to go through each step. One of the most important things to do on this second uh, half as we move to the practical strategies, and I really want you to come away from this with some practical strategies that you can take back to your programs, is you need to get buy-in from the top. And if you don't have this, and that's why it's listed as step one, it's gonna be very hard to change the culture at a place, right? You need to confirm your institutional priorities. So the way you do that is you need to know your standards, right? Your AR ARC, PA standards, RPA standards, being familiar with those, and also being familiar with the LCME, so the Liaison Committee on Medical Education and AAMC recommendations, right? If you can have that, that gives you meat to say, this is important, we need to do this, we're being uh, judged and, and evaluated based on that. Also reference peer institutions, reach out, and this is why PAEA is just so amazing, because we have so many colleagues we can connect with to find out, well, what are you doing? Right? And if you have a program that your program aspires to be like or a program that is considered your peer institution, uh, you can say, well, hey, over here at this program, this is what they're doing. Right? And that helps get that um, institutional support. Personal participation by the leadership is very important. So you know, if we're having any cultural competency training or cultural humility training or diversity training at your institution, seeing your leaders in that room says something. So those of you that are leaders in this room, being a part of those experiences says something to your faculty. It says something to the students. And the faculty feel that the things that they want to do are supported by the people on top. So getting buy-in is extremely important. All right. This is just what's called uh, the institutional curriculum model. And this article is very, very good. And I would love for you all at some point to read it. Um, and all it, just briefly to mention to you, this shows that the, the institutional curriculum is three circles, okay? And what they're suggesting is that there's three domains. The curriculum on paper, the curriculum in action, and the curriculum in the learner's experience, right? And when we're planning curriculum, or we're thinking about climate at an institution, these are all things that are at play. Essentially, the main important points of this, so if we look at domain A, is formal curricular elements we wanted to present but couldn't or didn't. So these are the things that may be on paper we want to do. Right? The curriculum in action over here is what the student is experiencing in real time. 
And then down here, the curriculum, I'm sorry, the curriculum and the learner's experience is what the, is the learner is experiencing. And the curriculum and action is what is being done. What we ideally want is F, right? So what we say, cultural competency on paper, the we've put into place things, lectures, small groups, that actually are there that we can use. And then the learners experience it. So domain F is where we want to be, right? And that just shows you. Um, G, not taught, but intended, but nonetheless experienced. F is what we planned, but was also taught and learned. And the only thing I want to point out is D is a frustrating place that many of our institutions may be in, right? So we have curriculum potentially on paper. We, have, we want to do cultural competency education. And perhaps we have lectures, but what's not happening is it's not being experienced in a way by students. Or what they see outside of what we teach them is in uh, direct opposition to what we want them to learn. So thinking about your institutional climate and reading the article, I think, is, a, is, is part to help you think about, well, what is the climate in my institution? How do I get that buy-in on top? Where are we is an important part of this. So it just gives you a way to think about it. Self-exploration and education. You might have not noticed uh, while you were entering, I had Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror <laughs> playing in the background. That was a subtle way to suggest that a lot of what we do in cultural competency and moving this process forward is going to have to start with us looking at what are we currently doing, right? Who are we looking in the mirror and saying either as a provider or potentially as a program? So implicit association testing. Has anyone ever taken the IAT? few of you. Great. I'll talk to you about what that is. And then program and curriculum assessment. So let's talk about the IAT. The Implicit Association Test, I think, is a fascinating tool. And um, I would strongly encourage you, if you are a provider, no matter what you do, you should take this test. And the an interesting thing about it, it's well validated, well studied. There's a book out called Blind Spot. Uh, there's lots of videos that have been done on the Implicit Association Test. But it's a fascinating test. Essentially, it is based upon keystrokes and how you respond based on keystrokes with what you see. And you can take tests about gender. You can take tests about religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation. They have about nine or 10. And the goal of the test is to not say you're right or you're wrong. It's more for you to think about where your biases are, your unconscious biases are. So based upon your timing of hitting a keystroke will determine what you, how you make associations, gets to that bias. So it's especially interesting if you find out that you have an implicit attitude that you're not aware of. So when I take the IAT, I have a strong preference towards white Americans. Now, many of you have noticed I'm not, I'm not a white American. I'm African American. Many may assume, well, why didn't I test as a strong preference for African Americans? But you have to think about the society in which I grew up. Perhaps there's some impl implications of that for me as a man that grew up in, this, in the United States. There are many individuals that may see, I am a feminist, and then they take the test and they have a strong preference for men. But perhaps that is because of the societal milieu that you grew up in, that although your intended actions and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis may be in direct opposition, there are unconscious forces that are influencing your decisions. And that's why the IAT is so important to take. So I would encourage you to do that. So that self-exploration piece starts with you, but also your students should take this. And this can be done in a group setting. It's very easy to do, um, and, and the instructions are there. So I would consider you taking it. There are some other resources, and one of those is the PAEA website, right? And the Diversity and Inclusion Council, or Inclusion and Diversity Council, uh, and the Cultural Competencies Committee. We're currently on, working on the website to improve the resources that you have, but there's also CME that you can get, that you can learn about cultural competency. And then the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services are more focused on how do we use interpreters, but that's also a wonderful resource and website for you to learn more about cultural issues. Program and curricular assessment involves a dialogue, so essentially you're going to need to talk to people about this. And I love this quote, we need to become more comfortable with the uncomfortable and less comfortable with the too comfortable. Meaning we have to have some difficult conversations about race, about ethnicity, about sexual orientation, about gender, in order to move forward. But if we approach it with an open mind, I think we can really move forward. Work cultural surveys and student surveys are important, right? We need to talk to individuals within our programs. Leaders at your PA um, uh, program, you need to think about how are the faculty doing? How are potentially underrepresented or marginalized faculty doing? What do they really think? 
and not be afraid of the answers and then what to deal with it. But we have to do a self-assessment. How and when are cultural issues introduced in your program? And one of the tools that you can use for that is the tool for assessing cultural competency training. And the TACCT was developed by the AAMC for medical schools, specifically MD programs, but can be used in PA programs. And again, if we're doing self-exploration and bias, I would encourage you to think about using the TACCT. And this just gives you an example of what it looks like. It's self-administered. All of the resources are there. They're free. They're available. And it goes through domains where you can check a box. Many of us are used to that, saying, well, yes, we have this in our educational curriculum. And then it allows you to identify strengths, but also potentially identify areas where you don't have content, right? So it's completely free. It's a wonderful framework. It is labor intensive, but I would encourage you to think about it if you are struggling with, well, needing to understand, well, where is this taught in our curriculum? And this just gives you another example of the various domains. It's too small for you all to see. But it's very detailed and, and took years to develop, but it's a valuable tool. And when the accreditation bodies, at least on the medical student um, side, this is, how this is a framework that they're going to be using. So if you are preparing for an accreditation cycle, if you're in a medical school setting, this information is important to help with that cycle, at least on the medical MD side. No, this is free. It's completely free. You just have to sign in for the AAMC. And actually, another resource that I didn't list is MedEd Portal, which is very beneficial. If you just go to MedEd Portal and type in cultural competency or diversity or disparities, there's tons of curriculums that, um, that faculty have um, had all over the country that are free. You just have to sign up. And as you know, medical providers, and you are completely able to do that. Step three, promote diversity at all levels. And this is extremely important to think about. And I just want to give you a framework of some diversity trends in PA education. And this is from the 27th Annual Report, not this most recent one, last year's, um, which is from, the, obviously, the year before. And just shows you, well, how is the PA profession doing in terms of diversity? And if you look historically, in the 1960s, 1970s, the PA profession actually was doing very, very well in terms of diversity of students, um, and more so than the medical, sky, medical side on the MD colleagues. But if you look at this, this graph, Essentially, this is white or Caucasian at the top, and then non-white. And this is over 20 or so years of data. It's pretty flat line, right? So there are certain groups within the non-white that have increased, obviously, Asian American students. Um, but traditionally underrepresented groups within PA education, Native American, African American, certain Asian subgroups, um, uh, Filipino, for, for instance, um, and uh, African American, Latino, are not increasing as fast as fastly as perhaps we would hope given the population. So how does that affect PA education? So what's happening on the faculty side? And this is the important uh, piece right here. So individuals from Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, 4.7%, white, 84%, African American, 5.6%, Native American, 1%, Asian, 3.4%. And the whole point of this is to show that when we are talking about cultural competency, we have to think about promoting diversity, not only in our faculty, and also in our students, in order to support uh, the, the environment that we want to create. How are the MD side doing, right? So if you think about the population, remember, you have to go all the way back to that slide I showed you about uh, demographics in the population. Um, look, Hispanic or Latino faculty, this is medical school faculty because, again, PA students don't practice in a vacuum or learn in a vacuum. You are off, we are all often learning with MDs uh, and PAs alike. So African American, 2.9 percent. Asian, 12.5 percent. Hispanic or Latino. So the point is, I think promoting diversity at all levels is going to support the environment that provides cultural competency for all groups. Right? So I would encourage your programs to think about that. It's a public good. We know from studies that individuals from underrepresented backgrounds are more likely to practice in underserved areas. So for those programs that have a vested interest in underserved areas, much like the Duke PA program, we have to continue to do a good job with recruiting a diverse group of individuals. And remember, diversity goes beyond black and white. A lot of times we assume we're just talking about black and white. And although that is important, in this country, sexual orientation, you have to think about that, socioeconomic status, diversity. There are many different definitions of diversity. And I would encourage you to continue to promote that throughout your, your educational process, your admissions process. It improves healthcare quality access, improves recruitment and retention of underrepresented students, then helps the pipeline, right? And many of these issues are pipeline problems. And diversity, just to plant a seed, does not always equal inclusion. 
So it's very possible you have a very diverse faculty, but there's a difference between being uh, at the table uh, and being in the room. And one of my colleagues that I worked with, if you think about uh, perhaps when you were younger, if you went to a dinner, like a Thanksgiving dinner, you have the adult table and then the kiddie table, right? Nobody wanted to ever sit at the kid table. You want to sit at the adult table. So you're in the room, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily included. So diversity is important. Checking a box is somewhat important. But what's more important is the inclusiveness of that atmosphere. Step four, develop a core of dedicated faculty. And I love this one because you need to have an opinion leader that will champion this cause. So finding someone on the faculty that says, look, I am willing to begin the process of developing cultural competency. And I would just encourage you to think beyond the usual suspects. Sometimes in programs there may, if you look at those numbers for faculty diversity, perhaps you have one or two individuals from an underrepresented group. It doesn't have to be that person that does the diversity issues, and in fact, the fact probably coming from a non-underrepresented individual or that message coming from a non-underrepresented individual may have more weight because that person doesn't necessarily come from that background where you would expect, oh, of course Dr. Raley is into that. You know, that may not be the case. And we shouldn't assume or and therefore put that responsibility on that individual. So it doesn't have to be a woman. It doesn't have to be a URM. And to the white males in the group, I would encourage you to take charge of this. This matters when individuals stand up in a room, much like I mentioned, when an MD speaks. When we have certain individuals that speak up from an administrative standpoint, that really moves things, unfortunate but true. So I would encourage you, all of us can do this. And consider training as part of the mandate. So if you're going to have this core of dedicated faculty, this isn't something I know because I'm an African American. I make mistakes. You can ask my wife. I stick my foot in my mouth daily. <laughs> She's nodding. So I make mistakes in clinical encounters as well. I am not any more culturally competent because I'm African American. I have to work at this. I have to learn. I have to be trained. And part of doing lectures like this is learning for me. Discuss cultural competency throughout education. So I have to give a shameless plug uh, for myself. I'm going to be doing a, po a poster about this uh, information. Um, but essentially, I did a study on does a lecture matter is what I was trying to figure out. Does a single lecture matter? And what most of the studies, this has already been, been done, and I just confirmed for myself that if you're going to do cultural competency education, it shouldn't just be one workshop shouldn't just be one hour. It needs to be a longitudinal experience in order to change behavior and change outcomes. Like anything, we don't necessarily have one hypertension lecture. We integrate it throughout. We don't have one infectious disease lecture. It's integrated throughout. The same needs to happen with cultural competency. So again, time is short in our curriculums. But if you can find a way to integrate that, you're going to be much better off. So essentially this study, and I'll skip through it, 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 what it did was I did a single lecture, survey before the lecture, after the lecture, and then eight weeks later to see if that change or self-perception change had been sustained. And the only effect that essentially had was uh, the ability to show a statistic, statistically significant difference in three areas. Ability to withhold judgment, curiosity, and discovery, and realization of personal bias towards certain groups. So what, we were able to sh what I was able to show is that individuals that had the lecture intervention, even eight weeks later, still thought that they had biases. But in most of the areas, and there were eight areas of self-perception, there was no difference. So a single lecture did not change much of an individual's perception of how they were with cultural competency. So the, the point of it, and what I assumed, is that my lecture, although I consider myself a fabulous lecturer, was not enough. <laughs> Just like this lecture won't be enough to potentially change, except in a few areas. That light bulb that goes off that says, oh, I'm a little bit more biased than I thought I was, OK? Um, so consider a lecture discussion during orientation week. Again, a practical strategy. Orientation week, have a cultural competency lecture. Start off the year that way, and then work in a way to introduce it throughout. You want to have cultural skills during history taken and physical diagnosis. We do that. All of us are required to teach physical diagnosis and history taking. Let's talk more about how to do it from a cultural, culturally competent way. And it's not different. It's not extra. It's just, a different, it's just a new way to think about it. Perhaps using standardized patients. You create cases that have cultural elements. All of us use OSCEs and standardized patients. Instead of having your traditional cookie cutter um, standardized patient situation, 
include cultural competency elements into that, make a cultural element to that case so that if the student asks this one particular question, the case unfolds in a whole new way, right? That's easy. That's something that doesn't require too much extra time. Clinical year, you can do this with M&Ms. You can do this with journal clubs. Uh, cultural questions can be included in analysis framework for M&M. &M. And then timely information and dissemination of all those potential opportunities. And teach practical skills. This is what the students really want. And I've done cultural competency lectures quite a few. And the feedback is always, when I stand up here and lecture like I'm doing now, it's not as effective. We've got to teach skills. We've got to equip students. That's what they want. They want to know what to do. So two quick examples of that, the learn model or the climbing questions. And I'll show you the climbing questions. Essentially, this is a way to get a history. This is a tool we can give our students. You put it in your question toolbox, just like the phrase, anything else, or what brings you in today. These are questions that we can teach students how to ask in order to get a culturally competent history. All right, and the last one, and then I have to stop, is make it a real science. And you want to have evidence that cultural competency is important, but you also want to have evidence that this bias and things exist. And students want skills, but they also want us to not always make this such a soft science and touchy-feely. There's data out there. Find the data, and the PAEA website is going to help you do that to show that this information is important. So this is my summary, and I'm going to stop. Thank you. <laughs> I guess if we have any time for questions. Yes. There, you know what a race is yeah. now. Wow, I only have no time for that answer. Um, and there are individuals more uh, versed at doing this than I. She mentioned that, that chart about diversity. It, perhaps diversity is not increasing within the PA education. And the only thing that I can say is this point to this. We need to become more comfortable with the uncomfortable and less comfortable with the too comfortable, meaning perhaps when we present that data, we sparse out those underrepresented groups so that it doesn't look so favorable, and then be comfortable with the discussion that happens after that. But until we do that, perhaps there are groups that we're not realizing are not included in that. So we have to be comfortable with being able to look at that data. And I can't answer the second one. That is a, hopefully someone will give a presentation on that. Thank you so much. Thanks. What time